I welcome and encourage you to take your Bible and turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. It's in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. We've started in Galatians chapter 5 for 10 weeks now, and hopefully you have that message outlined out. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, that's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so we've spent, been spending time going through the fruit of the Spirit. Love's the foundational fruit, and then the others are manifestations of that foundational fruit of love. A few weeks back, we focused on faithfulness, and we highlighted God's ongoing faithfulness, and we're going to do that every time. Here's this attribute of God that we appreciate and admire and notice in Scripture, and then God gifts that to us, and we're called to steward that in our life. <clears throat> and so do we thank God for his, his loyalty uh, to his gracious promises and his faithfulness? And then, of course, the harder one is that we're called then to embrace God's transformative faithfulness when we put our faith in Jesus, and then we develop close relationship with God, and then we're stewarding that, that faithfulness. And so do I thank God through trust in and loyalty back to him as he's been faithful and as an example and he gifts us by that internal transformation do it then do i thank god through trust in and loyalty back to him this time this week is that next one we just have a few more gentleness and then self-control but is gentleness and it's not one that's you know it's maybe admired in um how we interact with little children but other than that I don't think gentleness is much admired in our culture. And, and one definition is the quality, it's the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own self-importance. Now that's a mouthful, right? The quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own self-importance. It's humility, it's courtesy, it's considerateness, and it's meekness. So let's look at it. And first, when we think about the gentle spirit, we have to look at the first coming of Jesus Christ, and we appreciate Jesus' gentle spirit. So go to Matthew 21. It's the first of the Gospels, the first book of the New Testament, one of the four accounts of the ministry and life, the physical ministry and life of Jesus leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus has been traveling, you know, uh, from the north to the south, from Galilee area, now entering into Jerusalem. And you think, you know, he'd do that. I mean, he is, you know, God's son. So he'd do that majestically, powerfully. Um, you know, if they had fireworks, they'd be shooting those off, right? And there'd be swords and soldiers and maybe some grandiose music and all this majestic uh, uh, tradition. And he'd come in on a really big, you know, uh, horse, right? Maybe a stallion that would just look fantastic and just a really big, bold entry. <clears throat> but then we look and we admire Jesus' meek approach into Jerusalem. Jesus' meek approach. Look at Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I think it's Zechariah specifically, a little bit of Isaiah there. And here it is. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle. And how's that gentleness manifested? that peaceful spirit, riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey, right? And there's no way, if you've ever ridden a horse, right? And I, I, don't, I haven't done a, I don't have a lot of experience riding horses, but I think if you wanted to look imposing and majestic, you'd pick, you know, this, you know, big, bold stallion, right? And then if you had a lot of practice, you could just look, have this majestic entrance. But I'm not sure there's really any way to be dignified and grandiose riding on a young donkey. It's just not built for that. <laughs> so we got to admire here and notice 
Jesus make approach at his first coming as he enters into Jerusalem. And so part of Jesus' spirit is this gentle spirit, and we're called to appreciate his gentle spirit and admire that gentle approach, but also over it, it, it goes much deeper than just hopping on a little young donkey. It's even, it's much more about God's Son, God Himself, taking on human, human form like us. 100% God, then taking on 100% man, 100% human. And that condensation, that gentleness, that humility, that considerate spirit that's involved with that, being willing to go from creator to create it. Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul writes about that. And he talks about in the first several verses of chapter 2 about how we approach God's love and comfort from God's love and sharing in the spirit and, and then how we practice humility. And, and uh, in verse 5, he says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being, and so here's, here's the mindset we're called to have, and what did Jesus do? So Paul goes on to describe it. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we know from this passage and others that exaltation and power and glory comes, right? The resurrection and even into the second coming. But we want to capture here and apprehend Jesus' immeasurable humility. So we see this meek approach in Jerusalem in this immeasurable humility that goes from creator to created. And God himself, God's son, being willing to take on human flesh. So we want to appreciate God's gentle spirit shown in Jesus. And Jesus is gentle and kind, and he has this immeasurable humility. And so do I, and who's that directed toward? Why did Jesus do that? And, and we're called to notice and appreciate that that gentleness is directed toward us, toward you and me. And so I put on your outlines in red, it's pretty simple. Do I appreciate Jesus' gentleness directed toward me? Have we ever considered that, you know, we need, you need kind of cons a considerate approach that maybe we're hard to put up with, right? And, and maybe we'd be difficult and, and then God chooses through Jesus Christ to be gentle with us. And he directs that meekness and humility to us. And he does that on our behalf. And so do we appreciate Jesus' gentleness directed toward me, toward you, see, okay? So that's where we've done this series as we see it and we admire it in God. And then we take the next step. And then in this case, we can adopt then Jesus' gentle spirit. As we receive the spirit of Christ in our life, then we're called to adopt, to take in, to be transformed, to receive that gift of gentleness. And so we can then steward God's gift of gentleness, as I put it on your outline. And so remember, it's a gift. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So it's a gift from the Lord. And then we're called to receive that gift in close relationship with Christ, and then we steward that gift. So Paul, the Apostle Paul can write then, in Ephesians chapter 4, for example, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. So we're called to live a worthy life in keeping with receiving Christ. And, and what does that look like? Okay, he describes it. Be completely humble and gentle. And they're often tied close together, right? These fruit of the Spirit aren't distinct little entities floating out there. They're all tied together. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So gentleness is intricately tied to our calling from the Lord. And we're called to stewards God, steward God's gift of gentleness. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, 
as God's chosen people. So we've been chosen by God. We're his people, holy and dearly loved. He loves us. And he cares about us. We're his family. We're the body of Christ. Paul writes, clothe yourselves then with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So it's tied. These attitudes are all tied together. These gifts are tied together. And gentleness is just right there in the mix. You know, over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, Paul is writing, and he's writing, giving kind of like a charge to Timothy here. And he says, but you, in verse 11, and he's talking about kind of how the world deceives us and traps us and ensnares us. And then in verse 11, he says, but you, man of God, and that's ladies too, folks, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Then he says, fight the good fight, fight of the faith. You say, well, wait a second, gentleness and fighting, let's, we're, we're, we're kind of starting to develop something here that we want to capture a, a little bit as, as we go on. But when we put all these passages together, and there's others, folks, we're called to steward, to manifest God's gift of gentleness. And, and, and when we talk about having a gentle spirit, you know, frankly, some of us might say, well, you know what, pastor, gentleness just stinks, right? Aggressiveness, I mean, that's better standing up for oneself, making sure I'm not taking advantage of. Man, I gotta get ahead. Life's about personal success. If I'm gentle, I'm just gonna get squashed. If it's a, if it's a tough world and if I'm meek and mild, I'm just gonna get you know, run over. Chuck Swindoll, one of my favorite uh, longtime pastors, he writes this. In our rough and rugged individualism, we think of gentleness as weakness, being soft and virtually spineless. He says, not so. Gentleness includes such enviable qualities as having strength under control, being calm and peaceful when surrounded by a heated atmosphere, emitting a soothing effect on those who may be angry or otherwise beside themselves, and possessing tact and gracious courtesy that causes others to retain their self-esteem and dignity. Instead of losing the gentle gain, he writes, instead of being ripped off and taken advantage of, they come out ahead. Wow. You know, gentleness can be a real game changer in relationships. Someone else said this, never mistake gentleness with weakness. And we captured that a little bit when Apostle Paul talks about being gentle, and he says, fight the good fight of the faith. And this person said, gentleness stands up boldly to defend the cause of the Lord, but it suffers in silence when the attack is against self. And that's a nice contrast. And he writes, that is because gentleness is more concerned with the welfare of others than it is with the welfare of self. So we're called then to not only appreciate Jesus' gentle spirit, but then adopt Jesus' gentle spirit and steward God's gift of gentleness. And then we want to live in keeping as well as we look at the different aspects of gentleness and how we adopt that. We're, we're called to live in keeping with the Spirit's generosity. And if you look over in Titus chapter 3, there's this list that the Apostle Paul writes about uh, how we're to be and how, how, how church leaders are to be and what, 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 it, what it looks like. Uh, and what uh, church leaders are to remind people of and encourage people toward. And so in verse 1, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. And he goes on in verse 2, to, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. I mean, that's a pretty dramatic blanket statement. <laughs> And he contrasts, he says, at one time we, were, we too were foolish and disobedient, deceived and, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. And, and we lived in malice and envy and being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. See, Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. 
And how much renewal? Well, he says, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So the Spirit's outpouring, the Spirit's generosity changes everything. And we're called to, be, we're called to live in keeping then with the Spirit's generosity expressed toward us when we've responded in faith to the gospel. And that includes a gentle spirit. So we steward God's gift of gentleness, and then we're called to live in keeping with the Spirit's generosity that's been given to us. And then we choose to follow spiritual wisdom because sometimes our, our minds can be clouded and we have this contrast going on. Well, which wisdom do I follow? What really is wise in life? And, and is, there, you know, uh, is there multiple routes and multiple ideas of what wisdom is? And it can be kind of confusing. And so over in James chapter 3, starting in verse, team, uh, verse 13, James talks about that. And he says, who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's what, what does wisdom look like as it's ex expressed in life. And so he says, let him show it by his good life, okay, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And, and a lot of us capture that as you get older, you realize more and more what you don't know. And, and um, we, we, we get sometimes wiser when we get older, but we appreciate that um, there's a lot of humility mixed in that because you realize what you don't know and what you haven't learned. But he contrasts this and he says, wise and understanding among you, who is that? Let him show up by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But, verse 14, if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and in English, in this, this translation, it's kind of put in quotes, does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. So there's this contrast of what wis true wisdom looks like. and It gets confusing for us. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, and this is the spiritual wisdom we're called to choose to follow, right? The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving. It's considerate. That's that gentleness aspect. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in, right, in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And we've looked at some of these passages before as we've looked at these other fruit because they're tied together, folks. So we got a choice to make. Am I going to follow this biblical wisdom, this wisdom that comes from the Lord that says head toward humility, head toward a considerate spirit, head towards a gentle spirit, or will I head toward this bitter envy, selfish ambition, this conflict, this worldly approach that tends to produce? <laughs> right. So we adopt Jesus' gentle spirit, and we steward God's gift of gentleness. We live in keeping with the Spirit's generosity. We choose to follow spiritual wisdom in, in this. And another key one, and this is for teachers and, and preachers and Sunday school teachers and parents out there as well, we practice gentle correction in teaching. We practice gentle correction in teaching. And if you're actively parenting, you realize, wow, I, I already blew it uh, this week or even today. And I, you know, we're not actively raising our children anymore, but I can look back on many occasions where I did not follow this. And of course, I preach and teach as part of my ministry, my, my life calling. And I'm called to do that, and we're called to approach correction uh, gently and with gentle teaching. But sometimes we want to approach correction with this, I'm, I'm upset now, so I'm going to correct you. I'm going to, and especially sometimes old, long-time Christians, we can become more cynical and jaded. And it's like, well, this, this needs to be dealt with, and, and, and we're kind of real hard-nosed about it. Then we're captured by Scripture. So, for example, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him. It's like, oh yeah, I'll restore that person, all right. right? We think that and we act that way. But I left out a word. You who are spiritual should restore him gently. Right? Oh. Well, that's a little different, right? So we, we practice gentle correction 
in teaching. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul's instructing a younger uh, spiritual leader. And he says in verse 22, Flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant, here it is, folks, must not quarrel. Instead, you ready? He must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, and there will be opposition when you correct and you teach from God's word. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Oh, wow. Correct and teach gently. But now, I'm the one teaching right now. What about that other side of teaching, you know, as I'm listening or responding or hearing and or watching and um, experiencing God's Word on, on uh, a podcast or in my church family? So on the other side of teaching, there's this response to teaching. So James, uh, once again in chapter 1, he, he handles this very well, and he teaches us, and this is a very familiar passage. My dear brothers, he writes in verse 19, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And we know that one, right? It's like, mm. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Boy, that's an understatement, right? Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you, right? So if you're here and you want to respond to the teaching of God's word, it's not just about hearing it, but it's accepting it, and that, that word can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, as James writes, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, right? Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And then you notice it says guy here, not a gal, because guys are just kind of inattentive, right? But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Folks, we don't receive God's blessing just from hearing the word, but hearing it and then doing it. And so there's this both sides of the teaching and correcting. We're called to receive it with hum humble and submissive and gentle spirits. We're also, we're also called to give it, whether it's correction or teaching and the full, the full spectrum there. We're called to give that in a gentle manner. So we practice gentle correction in teaching. Finally, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we follow a gentle gospel path. And I'm sure we've all experienced, and I, I certainly have, and I, if you've been in churches and maybe been around, it's, um, some pastors are more fire and brimstone, very forceful, strong, and maybe pound and angry and sometimes yelling and, and really kind of uh, expressing anger about what's going on. And, and sometimes we get frustrated and we want to communicate the gospel with people, and so we get upset and, and maybe divisive and we enter into conflict, and, and we can handle God's word and we can handle the communication of the gospel in less than gentle and respectful ways, right? And maybe some of us have been guilty of that over the years. And so then we're reminded that we're called to follow a gentle gospel path. And that doesn't mean never share the gospel. I'll be gentle with people. I'll just keep my mouth shut. No, that's not the idea. But so we want to be on that gospel path. But how do we do that? And so for, Peter tells us, and he writes in verse 15, it's one of my favorite life kind of section of verses, is these verses right here. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So we want to be prepared to be able to share why we have this hope in Jesus Christ. And so there is this gospel path that God wants us to be on and actively communicating his word. But do this with gentleness and respect and keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. 
So you notice that gospel path, God says, I want you to be on it. I want you to be progressing and communicating. But when you do that, do that in a gentle and respectful way and keep a clear conscience when you do that. Really follow Christ in terms of your character. So we're called, folks, to appreciate Jesus' gentle spirit and then adopt Jesus' gentle spirit. So we don't just say admire Jesus, you know, and his condescension as he came. Um, I think I said that right, right? As he came in from God uh, in, in heaven and came and become, became a man and how he entered Jerusalem on the donkey and so forth. And so we're called to appreciate that, but then we're also called to adopt that gentle approach. And so do I adopt, do you adopt, Jesus' gentleness expressed toward others? And we're called to appreciate that Jesus is gentle toward us and say, thank you, Lord. But then do we adopt Jesus' gentleness and do we take it in and we're transformed and then we steward it? And then is that expressed toward others? And folks, I really believe this approach can make a world of difference in the viability of our gospel witness. And also in the health and well-being of our relationships in and outside our church family. I imagine most of you, unless you're a little little, and then if you are, you can't understand me, but uh, you've cracked an egg or two, right? And maybe for some of you, it's hundreds and thousands of eggs. And uh, you know, egg cracking is kind of a little bit of an art and skill, right? And some of us are good at it, and some of us are really klutzy, but you crack an egg, and if you do it just right, you know, and the, the egg uh, uh, separates and the white and the yolk separate from the egg, and, and then you can use that, and you got the, the shell, you can put that aside, and, and you know, you can make an omelet, or you can add ingredients to cake. There's all these kind of cool, beneficial things you can do. But when you crack an egg um, kind of ungently, if you will, and you kind of just, right, and, you know, you, you, you cause a mess, right? Uh, there's a gentle approach to cracking an egg that's kind of precise and you got it and it's good for everybody. And then there's this non-gentle approach where you literally get egg all over the place, right? And then we have a mess. And I think that's a lot like our Christian life. When we choose <clears throat> and uh, we're dealing in relationships with people, right? And, people inside the church family or in our own household, people outside the church, and we're working on uh, living a Christian life, and some of us, I don't know, gentleness, whatever, and, and we're like, uh, you know, cracking an egg really bad. And we end up with a mess, and we have a cracked egg, and the shell's mixed in with the yolk, and it's just a mess. Sometimes it's on our face, it's all over our clothes, on our hands, and we've made a mess of the situation. Instead, God says, hey, why don't you try a gentle approach? Even in those hard situations, like trying to crack an egg well, it's a little hard, right? It takes a little skill. Even in those hard situations, gentleness allows us to crack the egg, right? And do it in a way that doesn't make a mess, see? So I really encourage you in that. Do I appreciate Jesus' gentleness directed toward me? And then do I adopt Jesus' gentleness expressed toward others? Hey, let's pray. Father, sometimes we can take an approach that's like a, a bull in a china shop. And it's kind of hard to fix everything up once we've broken everything. So God, will you give us this spirit of gentleness, um, a gentle touch, a, a humble touch, a considerate touch, a courteous touch that really permeates um, our relationships. And we see the model of Christ. And as we respond in faith and you gifted, God, help us to steward this gentle approach. A strength under control, a sense of meekness that pervades relationships, that changes, that brings a, um, a breath of error and in life into a tense, hostile situation. Guide us in what a gentle spirit will look like in our life as we appreciate Jesus consideration toward us may we have that kind of approach starting in our home and in our community in our church life husbands and wives with our kids with people that we'd love to see respond to the gospel guide us Lord please help us to be good stewards in Christ's name amen